Uh, so now on to the Learning and Teaching Award, which celebrates quality learning experiences created for learners of any age and ability that use the library's digital content. It will be introduced uh, by my colleague, Rhea Bartlett, lead producer on-site learning at the British Library. Uh, Rhea has worked in a learning team for 15 years and managed the on manages the on-site learning program, doing some fantastic work supporting a broad range of audiences, including schools, teachers, families, communities, and adult learners. Rhea Bartlett. Hey, thank you. I can't believe I've got to follow a piece on fashion, but I'm going to do my best. Um, thank you, Mahendra. Yes, so I'm Rhea Bartlett and I work in the learning team here at the British Library. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon um, and it was also brilliant to be part of the judging panel for the Teaching and Learning Award. So the BL Labs Teaching and Learning Award recognises outstanding and innovative work um, that has been carried out using the British Library's digital collections and data and which has an impact on some aspect of teaching and learning. So this year we were delighted to receive four entries. I'm just going to go through um, each one in a bit more detail. Okay, so first up... Um, we've got using the British Library newspaper archive site to family and social historians. Um, so this was produced by Keith um, Gregson. Um, Keith is a historian and author, um, and he made extensive use of the British Library's newspaper archive to research a number of projects, including f family genealogy, village cricket, a Victorian house, rugby pay players from Sunderland Rugby Football Club, um, and this resulted in two online books and several publications. Um, so next up we have Tangible Queries in Online Cultural Heritage. Um, this was produced by Javier Pereira. Um, so this was designed to be used in a museum, gallery or library setting. This is an innovative way of encouraging users to conduct Boolean searches such as and or not um, across digitised heritage collections within Europeana. Um, so this includes British Library materials also. Um, Javier has created a tangible user interface um, using smart paper-based physical objects and open source technology. And the whole system um, is available to download from the web. So next up is um, Pocahontas and After. Um, so this was produced by Michael Walling, Lucy Dunkley and John Cobb. Um, and this is a project that came about in response to the British Library's work relating to the 400th anniversary um, of Pocahontas' visit to London. So it's a pho photographic um, archive of First Nations people. It encouraged, it, it encouraged the public to respond to the images um, with their own photographs. Um, and you can have a look um, at the catalogue here. Um, the website's just on that slide there. Um, and last but not least... We have Jonah Komen, um, who produced a project called Pocket Miscellanies. Um, so this is a delightful collection of 10 online pocketbook zines. Um, each features images of medieval manuscripts, many taken from the library's digitised manuscripts collection. And each pocketbook explores visual representations of specific aspects of medieval life, um, with a real kind of focus on um, underrepresented and dis disenfranchised um, communities. So, drum roll, the runner-up um, for this award, for the 2018 BL Labs Teaching and Learning Award, um, goes to Pocahontas and After. So congratulations to Michael Walling, Lucy Dunkley and John Cobb. Well, thank you very much, Ria and everybody, for, for this. I'm Michael Walling. Uh, <laughs> and I'm the Artistic Director of Border Crossings. Uh, this is Lucy Dunkley, who's our Associate Director, and John Cobb, who took some of these lovely photos you're going to have a look at. Um, we're a cross-cultural theatre company. Uh, that's a very Catholic term. We use it in all sorts of ways. One of the things we do is every two years we produce the Origins Festival of First Nations, which is to do with the indigenous cultures of the world gathering in London, the city from which their lands were once colonized. And of course, in 2017, 16 to 17, that meant associating with the Pocahontas visit 400 years previously. And we wondered how on earth we could 
use our work to engage um, people with understanding something that has happened 400 years ago. And the first clue came in this very room when the British Library did a conference about Pocahontas at which we screened the film. And at that conference, I was lucky enough to meet Sierra Tazy Baker. Oh, that's not meant to happen. That's meant to happen. And the winner is Oz. <laughs> So can we have another check as well? And <laughs> we're doing really nicely out of this. Um, so Sierra um, was a contemporary Pocahontas. Does this thing work? <laughs> can you move to the next one? Yeah. There she, so there she is, uh, 400 years on, another 21-year-old Native American princess came to London, and John photographed her outside Cyan House in Brentford, which is the house where Pocahontas stayed for a time while she was here. And that started us thinking, what happened if we accessed the British Library's digital archives of photographs of Native American people and got young people, refugees, and adult volunteers from the diverse communities now living in London to make their own self-portraits in response to those? What might that start to tell us about the way in which we have looked at indigenous peoples and the way in which we look at ourselves. And so the project became about that, and we were very, very lucky to have the collaboration of Philip Hatfield here at the library, who's now the head of the Echo Center, and was like a kind of virtual Ariadne guiding us <laughs> through the labyrinths of the online collections. And we just wanted to show you a few examples of what people did. So this uh, is a photo of a famous uh, First Nations Canadian runner called Tom Longboat from the Six Nations Reserve in Ontario. And you can see there that Tom has the Canadian maple leaf on his shirt. That was because he had just won. Because it was a bit of an Andy Murray situation. You know, when, when Andy Murray wins, he's British, and when he loses, he's Scottish. <laughs> when Tom Longboat won, he was Canadian. And when he lost, he was a lazy Indian. And that's what it said in the press. And Alfie here, who is a young man from a council estate in West London, also see sport as his way forward. Um, and so you can see what happens as he takes that as a model for his own sense of self. In this one, um, this is a picture taken by um, a photographer called Byron Harmon, who in the early 20th century was spending a lot of time in the, uh, the Western areas of the United States and Canada, um, photographing native people in very traditional ways. It's part of the sort of Edward Curtis vibe of uh, the last of a dying race. Uh, look at these traditions, aren't they quaint and exotic? And you can see that the Mrs. Simeon here, these are two sisters, look a little bit uncomfortable in their traditional clothes being paraded for tourist tat. And so Rose, um, who's nine years old, um, got her own sister to come along and they made this image in response about sisterhood. And what's really interesting about this is that Rose and her sister are Iraqi refugees. And yet that's not the image that we would associate with Iraqi refugees. This is what happens when you deconstruct a historical image of sisterhood that is presented as a form of ethnicity, if you like, and you ask people to become the subject of their own narrative. And so we get another example of it uh, in this brilliant picture, I think, done by Sebastian. Um, the, origin, the, the heritage picture dates from 1915, and it's called Four Patriotic Indian Chiefs. Uh, you can see they're in a car with the Union Jack draped over the bonnet. It's 1915. You can work it out. On the other photos in the same collection, you can actually see that the native people are being pushed into their various positions by Mounties, who are making sure that they appear to be patriotic as a way of helping the war effort. Sebastian uh, was born in Ghana, and you can see he's wearing his traditional Ghanaian shirt. The car he's holding is a toy car from Africa, but the red, white, and blue flag is there behind him and that's because his father works on the London Underground. So who gets to frame the migration? Who is it who's actually uh, governing the narrative? He's raising the question through the image that he creates. So I think these are artworks 
And it's really nice to be honored for teaching and learning, <laughs> as well as art. Um, but I do think that most of the teaching was done by the young people involved, and most of the learning is done by those of us who are lucky to, enough to see what they achieved. So thank you. Thank you so much. It's an incredibly um, moving set of portraits. I would encourage you to look online to look at um, the others we've not got to see today. Um, so you might know what's coming next. We had a slight reveal there. Uh, it is the winner. So the winner of um, the BL Labs 2018 Teaching and Learning Award <coughs> goes to um, Pocket Miscellanies. Um, congratulations to Jonah Coleman. <laughs> Hi, um, thank you very much for um, you know nominating me for this award. It's it, it's very unusual. Um, I, I feel sort of out of context here because we're at like a a, a digital festival and um, my stuff is very tactile and very you know sort of. Um, if you haven't seen them, um, I I showed these um, we zines in the other room. Um, there might be some up, up for grabs, but it, they're essentially little pocket-sized uh, zines, um, 10 of them in the beginning. I'm, I'm making more as, yes. <laughs> um, they, I mean, they look like doo -doo -doo, this. They're absolutely tiny. Um, and um, I, for the luxury... Um, sort of format, they look like this, which is very much a, a medieval English format for books. Thank you very much. Um, so I want to take you through here, um, through the way I sort of, you know, came up with this idea. Um, it's mainly, um, these are medieval images that people don't really have access to. So um, even though they're freely available, a lot of them on the internet and stuff, uh, they are still hidden behind like code names and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I felt that it was really, really important to put them out there because of uh, appropriation that has happened within the past few years um, of medieval and classic imagery um, by the alt-right and, um, you know, the fascists in America. Um, scholarship has, you know, kicked back, um, specifically on blogging and microblogging platforms. Uh, BBC Radio had recently a, um, a, a show about black Elizabeth Elizabethans. Um, nonetheless, medieval images are usually sort of like a meme -y thing to share. Um, the, the top one is like, when you give him a fake number and you see him in public. Um, and, you <laughs> <laughs> and you know, like, yeah, cool, but do you actually know what that is? Do you know who that is? Um, do, you, do you understand how the female body is represented? Do you, you know. Um, so what I did is put all of this information in small um, zines. Uh, zines is short for magazines. They are these DIY, um, super quick to make um, paper goods. They, are, they have a rich connection with the punk and uh, queer underground um, uh, activism. And um, I was given the idea to make zines rather than something, you know, more like formal um, by, this is, this is how I research. I do, I'm doing a PhD in medieval studies and the, this is my Pinterest board where I put images and categories. Um, and um, the, the size, the miniature size is not just because they're, you know, it's easy to share, but they're actually inspired by um, sizes and shapes of medieval um, artifacts that we don't have access to anymore because everything is digitized. 
Um, so the first iteration was absolutely tiny and had very, very little information in terms of the, the narrative behind it. Uh, it had information about where to find the image, but not necessarily what the image tells you. Um, so I made the bigger zines. Um, they're co-created with uh, other um, PhD students and early career researchers, um, specifically because they're they're an agile way of sort of like putting out your research. Um, you know, with book uh, publication, you have to like wait years and years and years and pay a lot of money to put these out. Um, this is really quick and. Um, easy. Uh, main problem is and why it is probably in teaching and learning, not in the uh, commercial category, is um, it has suffered from commercial uh, copyright issues, a lot of, sorry, I'm going to skip that, a lot of the um, libraries <coughs> that have digitized images are, you know, put their stuff here rather than up there. Um, so, for example, Biblioteca Apostolica Vaticana and the Morgan Library and, um, Museum have um, images that you can't sell, you can't even crop. On the other side, uh, the BNF and the BL, they're free to use, free to distribute and all that kind of stuff. But I didn't want to limit myself to only things that have survived and been digitized by the BL and the BNF. So, um, I chose to to work with all of these. Um, so the last thing is that because I can't sell them and everything, um, they're not extremely expensive to make. Um, they're just sort of, you know, A3 pages, double-sided colors. But they're still, you know, I have to make them and put them out there. Um, so the easiest way to sort of fund them is to... Um, uh, have opened the Patreon, and uh, medievalists are really, I mean, you know, my, my peers basically are supporting me, not only through their scholarship and through their enthusiasm, but also with, you know, like a tip jar. Um, so yeah, this is how they look like. If you want to own some of them, either go in the other room and nab them while you can. Uh, if not, go to my Patreon. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think. Yeah.